My name is Professor Nana Asari. I am a native Houstonian uh, by way of Germany, by way of Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to invite you or to host you this evening or this afternoon to, the, to this webinar. This is the COVID-19 international trade and the impact on African business discussion. We have a wonderful list of panelists that we'll be introducing throughout this evening. And so sit back, relax, make sure you provide some comments or feedback, or if you have any questions, that you do so. And we'll try to get through to all the questions or as much as we can. We are a bit on the time limit. So please um, sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy the show. We want to thank everybody for tuning in. Before we get started, let me give a huge uh, thank you to Denta and the entire Guba team, Jennifer, Kojo, um, Lucy, all the people behind the scenes that worked so hard to put the show together and make it a success. We want to thank you for your efforts. Also want to thank all the panelists for accepting, and we look forward to this discussion today. Again, my name is Professor Nana Sari, um, faculty member at Texas Southern University, where I teach sport law and sport management. I'm also a serial entrepreneur. Um, I have businesses that range in technology to sport management uh, to also travel and tourism. I'm also the vice chairman of the Ghana Houston Chamber of Commerce, as well as a board of director at the Texas West African Trade, uh, Texas West African uh, Commerce, Chamber of Commerce, excuse me. And so with that being said, um, I want to, you know, really open up our discussion, but this environment that we're in, right, this new environment that we're in has, uh, it, it, it's ripe for the discussion centered around African trade and African businesses. There are so much that there was so much energy and positive energy surrounding Africa in 2019 that we had, and that momentum, a little bit of that has been lost. But I don't think that we should lose sight uh, because there are wonderful things that are still happening on the continent. And with that being said, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Mr. Mazda Denon. He is the global trade manager at, at the Trade International Affairs of uh, City of Houston at the mayor's office. Mazda's background is that he originally hails from Benin. He's fluent in both French and English. He holds two bachelor's degrees in accounting and finance. And he is currently in the process of earning a graduate certificate at Texas A&M in international affairs with emphasis on intelligence. Mazda joined the mayor's office in 2016 and is responsible for developing outreach strategies for engaging international governments, businesses, and communities. He also plans and executes the mayor, mayor's trade missions, coordinates international events focused with international focus, and organizes the mayor's international business advisory council. Mazza also serves as a special advisor on African affairs and is responsible for overseeing all diplomatic, business, and cultural exchanges between the city of Houston and the continent of Africa. Brother Mazza, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's a pleasure to see you again. Well, how are you? Yeah, I'm well. I'm well. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. You don't have the uh, COVID cut like most of us. What's been going on? Are you you seen the barber, or what, what, are you doing it all yourself? Come back again. Uh, I know we're a bit rushed for time, so I'm going to go ahead and proceed with the questions. If you want, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your role at the. Uh, uh, at the as the global trade ma manager at the city of Houston, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Mazda Dinan, and uh, I'm the global trade manager, uh, the mayor's office of trade in international affairs. And uh, our role is to is to support the development of international trade uh, to bring increased economic opportunity to Houston citizens and, uh, and company. And uh, by doing that, we work with uh, a lot of stakeholders, uh, chambers of commerce. Uh, we have the, the largest uh, medical center. We work with them below. We have the GHP, which the, we call the World Trade Center. So we have a lot of stakeholders and partners that we work with in order to, to promote Houston. So our, our our, our only role is to make sure that uh, we put Houston on the map and making sure that uh, uh, people see Houston as international health for commerce. That's uh, briefly our, you know, what we do in our Office of uh, Trade International Affairs here in Houston. 
Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And so far, how would you say the the pandemic, this new environment, how has that affected you and your colleagues and, and uh, interacting with other business owners and also other chambers? You know, uh, as you can see, you know, you live in Houston, you can see how things are right now. Uh, we were there was a there were a lot of projects that we were we, we were working on, uh, especially myself uh, uh, regarding Africa. Right, a uh, few months ago, I was in D.C. with my colleagues, uh, meeting with all some of the African ambassadors in D.C. Uh, we we trying to promote trade and increase uh, the trade tie between Houston and uh, and Houston. And also we were trying, we were putting together the first uh, energy summit with uh, African head of states. And as you can, as you can see, we canceled uh, Sarah Week and, 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 and OTC, a major international uh, events. So you can see how this, this situation, COVID-19, uh, is affecting our daily life and as and at the same time uh, how we do we do business and i mean we are trying to find the best way now to do business to uh but it won't be it won't be easy but i believe we can uh, we will we will find the best way uh, uh, moving forward yes thank you for that response obviously no one can predict the future but do you anticipate that there will be further discussions should there be you know uh, sort of a containment of this virus, do you foresee that um, the Energy Summit and um, OTC and other events will uh, come back online? Do you anticipate that? Um, this year, honestly, I don't see I don't see it happening this year. For instance, we have Africa Day. You know, we were, we've been hosting Africa Day every year here in, uh, uh, in Houston at City Hall, and it's got canceled. And I don't see all those international uh, uh, events, business events, I don't see, I don't see them happening this year or for sure next year. But we, we the, the the challenge would be uh, finding new ways of, of of doing things because when you put in uh, five hundred thousand people in the same uh, 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 arena or same room, that we have to find a way of doing things, uh, I would say, better. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you know there's been a huge resurgence and a lot of uh, controversial talks about the role of China in global trade, uh, most specifically the role of China in Africa. Uh, what are some of your concerns or thoughts as it relates to the, the role China's playing uh, in African trade? Um, any thoughts there? I mean, we, we can even before before COVID nineteen, uh, you know, I, I, I read somewhere that uh, the the air traffic between uh, China and uh, and uh, and Africa was up to I think six six hundred thirty percent. So you can see the increase of you know movement where there's businesses you know between uh, uh, between uh, China and uh, in Africa, and we we are real. I mean, we rely too much on on China, and then when I say, because we're talking about China, right? So now, how can we make sure that we don't we don't depend too much on China? How do we make sure that local production, right, uh, 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 benefits? Africa, instead of always, you know, uh, 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 trying to import goods and services from not only China but you know Europe and Latin America, uh, and 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 uh, and the U.S. And you see the impact of the lockdown. For instance, the pharmacy uh, pharmaceutical product, right? In the supply chain, if China close, you know, mm -hmm. uh, its borders, like how can we get those those, those products? So we had to find a new way in Africa, you know, Africa in general, to uh, promote local production, the supply chain, and make sure that we don't rely too much on uh, uh, other countries. Because guess what? Those countries as well, they're having their, their, you know, their own trouble. They're having their own issues. So if they cannot be able to feed their own people or to provide good, you know, services, 
basic services to their own people, how you know could they uh, 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 you know think about or do even do business you know with the with Africa? So we have to find as you know, like I said earlier, we have to find new ways you know uh, of doing business internationally when it comes to international trade. And when we say international trade, right, we say is import export, right? Two countries or you know regions, I mean regions and all that. Now, even before COVID nineteen. I don't want to say, but do 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 you think that the same way uh, foreign companies or foreign countries bringing uh, uh, goods and services or selling goods and services in Africa are we doing the same thing? Do we do do you think that African companies or countries are selling the goods and services, whether in the U.S., in China, in Europe? So I think we just have to find a you know best way and good way to 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 engage in this new uh, 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 I would say post post COVID-19 and then it, it should be we should use this opportunity right the African leaders to use this opportunity to think about how they can uh, 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 they can uh, they can be they can how the focus right can be or how they can focus more and uh, uh, production and, 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 and trade within uh, Africa. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, just to point out uh, some um, statistics, um, in 2019, African Trade Report reported that Africa's total merchandise trade for 2018 was more than $997.9 billion, and that Africa remains one of the fastest growing regions in the world. And so to that extent, um, Houston being the fourth largest city in America, it would seem that there would be a great opportunity for increase of trade and trade missions. And as you said, what would be some of the objectives of those trade missions, those various trade missions? We don't want people just to come to the city of Houston and shake hands and eat fancy dinners. What do you think that some of the objectives are behind the mayor's vision for trade missions, particularly to Africa? And why is the city of Houston so integral in terms of the African community? Uh, in, African, in African business? You know, uh, Africa has one of the largest uh, uh, African, I mean, Houston, I'm sorry. Houston has one of the largest African diaspora in the world, right? You know that. So uh, it's really important for us to focus on uh, increasing trade ties between uh, Africa and, uh, and, uh, and the U.S. And you, you mentioned trade missions. When we, what, to be, to be, what what we do when we go on trade missions, right, is to make sure that we sell Houston, make sure that we promote Houston, make sure that we tell we tell the story about Houston. Because when people think about the U.S., right, they think about uh, uh, you know uh, New York, uh, what Boston, San Francisco, L.A., and all that. So we want to make sure that uh, we we go out there and promote Houston and sell Houston and tell and tell and tell uh, uh, countries and, and and businesses the 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 advantages. Okay, uh, uh, when it's come to investment, if you're going to invest invest in Houston, uh, in Houston. So Africans right now, there's a lot of incentives, right? When it's come to the city of Houston, uh, we have the opportunity zone that you can come and uh, and 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 invest, right? And there are so many incentives that you can you can you can gain if you decide to to invest uh, uh, in uh, in in Houston. And that and that's our goal. We we are, we 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 want African companies right to come and invest. But at the same time, we have companies here they want to go to Africa, right, to invest. And then I think how because it, it it should be two ways. It, it, should, it shouldn't be just one way. Okay, African companies come come come, come to Houston or, or the US and invest, or you know, uh, uh, companies here going to Africa and invest. It got to be two ways. And then we, uh, my office, right? We that's what we 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 do. We are working on increasing increasing uh, whether it's educational, uh, cultural uh, ties between uh, uh, Africa, Africa, the Africa continent. And uh, in Houston, and uh, uh, how how do we do that? We have a consulate, right, that we work with, 
we have the Chamber of Commerce that we work with. So it, uh, I think that uh, that uh, you know ways that are ways to 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 uh, uh, to promote Houston and to increase uh, ties between uh, Houston and the, and the continent of Africa. Excellent. So now we have the challenge of borders being closed, travel restrictions. How do we maintain that sense? of uh, urgency in terms of increasing trade missions and trade objectives between the two um, continents, Africa and uh, North America, specifically uh, Houston, uh, in this new environment? What, what are some ideas you think that we can incorporate during this time? We, we, we have to find new ways. We have to find new ways. And then one of them should be uh, uh, e-commerce, right? We have, to, we have to make sure that uh, because when people, uh, countries are closing their borders, right? What what can we do to make sure that uh, whether you're in Benin or Ghana or Nigeria, you can still do business, you know, with your counterpart, you know, in the other side of the, uh, the on the other side of the of the world. So uh, uh, I believe we have to, uh, uh, you know, digitalize our our economy, and then you know that the. the Finance and the access of internet. In, but now in Africa, is you know, it, uh, it's, I mean, we're doing better, right? But we need to, the focus should be on that, like e-commerce. How can we uh, make sure that our, our, our African businesses, they can easily, uh, whether they want to buy a product or sell the product, they can do it like, easily. So that means the financial service, that like, have to be, we really have to invest, right? Uh, uh, those infrastructure to make sure that a company in Africa can easily uh, 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 sell or buy uh, 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 goods and services. Because I, t- I would tell you right now, things thing would not be the same. So we got to find a new way to to, uh, to do business. And, and, and the one thing that comes to my mind would be just uh, uh, the e-commerce. How can we make sure that we use technology to, to increase, uh, 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 I mean, to do business? Excellent. We just had a question from Eja Anani, such a uh, good friend of mine, a fraternity brother and fellow chamber member, uh, Houston a native. Um, Eja says, what has some of the accessible avenues for trade for African countries uh, in, in Houston? What has been some of the accessible avenues for trade for African countries into Houston and vice versa? What are some of the roadblocks that has limited trade or investment opportunities um, prior to COVID-19? You want to speak to that a, a bit? Thank you. Well, Question. What what we used to do or what we do often here uh, in our office, we we work a lot with our partner, a lot with our partners, like a chamber of commerce. Those are the people that we work with, like I'm telling you on a daily basis, right? So can you we, name some uh, chambers, please, so that they get it. Can you name some of those chambers that you work closely with? I mean, we work, we have that we we have the the Texas West Africa Chamber of Commerce. We have the Africa Bilateral U.S. Uh, Africa uh, Chamber of Commerce. We have the Arab Bilateral Chamber of Commerce. So we have a lot of chamber, you know, chambers that we work with, right? So yes, Ghana Chamber. Because I we we I remember uh, two years ago we we hosted your your Minister of Com- Trade and Business Development, right? So what we we. We try to step up to, to stay close and 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 be engaging, right? Like, uh, for instance, we 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 encourage uh, chambers, right, to bring elected official, government official from 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 Africa, for instance, right. So when they come, is a is a is a great avenue to talk about trade. How can we? Of course, Washington over there they have a trade policies. And we have to respect that. But then, at the same time, how can Houston take advantage of what has been done in 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 DC? And then, when we have Houston have the largest uh, medical center in the world, right? We have a, a we, we call Houston uh, energy capital of the world. So, how can African companies benefit from that? So. We've been working a lot, like I said earlier, with chambers and then also with government officials and the council, uh, uh, the, the consulate. We have the Ghana, uh, 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 Ghana consulate. We have uh, 
uh, Malawi. So we, we, we were working a lot with those uh, government officials, elected officials, and also uh, uh, when we go to DC, because you know the, the ambassadors they uh, they they represent their countries here in the in the uh, in the in the US. And what we do like a few months ago, we we went to DC to meet with those ambassadors, Ghana, Senegal, Benin, uh, uh, Nigeria, to to talk about Houston. Okay, this is Houston. It, we want we want investment. We want African companies to come invest in Houston. And uh, like this morning, I, I was in conference call with one of the uh, uh, African companies. Uh, they want to invest in uh, in Houston, and we have the economy development team. So what we do is when we have those calls, we we make sure that we assist them with anything they may need. We do not make deals, but we can broke introduction, right? Uh, if the company is looking for warehouse or like anything that the company may need to set up the shop here in Houston, we will make sure that we find partners on the ground here in Houston to make sure that uh, 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 you know the company, uh, the investor uh, um, has you know whatever they are uh, he or she may need to to set up shop here in Houston. Excellent. Thank you so much, Martha. I know you're pressed for time. Before we uh, go, if you would um, tell folks how they can get in contact with you, if you want to share some of your social media handles or even your email address for folks to get in touch with you if they have questions. And then, yeah, um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, yeah, if you could share your contact details. And then also, um, uh, finally, uh, uh, your closing thoughts on this particular environment some of your take home messages, one, two, or three take home messages that you would like to, to leave the audience with uh, concerning uh, COVID-19 and African trade? Oh, first, my uh, my contact, uh, you know, I can be reached uh, by, you know, emails is mazda.denon at houstontx.gov. It's mazda, my first name, M-A-Z-D-A dot denon, D-E-N-O-N at houstontx.gov. And that's the best way of reaching out uh, to reach out to me. You can email me easily. Now, uh, take home take home what, messages. Yes, what what we have seen with COVID nineteen, uh, the African government they have to make sure that they take advantage of this situation, right? Uh, how can we? Uh, I know there's a lot of discussions about the African uh, continental free trade area. So how can we make sure that we, we, we speed up the process? And then, because like I said, things think would not be the same. So how can we take advantage of these situations and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, help our African businesses to, to, to export their goods and, uh, and services? And I think three things that the government needs to do will be to uh, to create a stable political environment and uh, 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 the human capital because I've, I, we have some one of the things that we have we have, we, we have heard from uh, uh, major uh, companies trying to invest in Africa is the human capital the workforce because they, sometimes they go over there and they say we don't have uh, the labor the local the local local labor uh, we don't. They don't. They, they, they can. They can get local labor. So they have to bring their own people, and that's not. That's not good for 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 Africa, right? And then the last thing I would say would be, would be the infrastructure. We have to build the infrastructure to support uh, investment uh, in Africa. So those are the three things that I really want to make sure that, uh, 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 you know, Africa as well. You know, we we make sure that uh, we uh, we do those things. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mazza. Really want to uh, extend a hearty thank you to you and your team for all your efforts throughout the years in helping the business community here. And we will be working closer in the future and making sure that those goals and objectives are met, met especially with the um, trade mission. We had a couple of uh, comments and questions from uh, Isaac Aduhine of okay. Poku. Uh, fortunately, your time has ended. So we'll see if we can address Isaac's uh, question uh, throughout our. And, you know, throughout the discussion. But I wanted to thank you again. And uh, 
Good luck, and we'll see you soon, brother. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, let's get ready for our next speaker. Uh, allow me to welcome uh, the distinguished Dr. Afua Asabia Asari, who has my namesake. Uh, maybe we're related. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe, maybe we'll figure out whether there's some relations here. Uh, but welcome, uh, Dr. Afua Asabi Asari. Uh, congratulations, first and foremost, on your 2020 Woman of Excellence Award. Um, Thank you. Dr. Afua Asari is the Chief Executive Officer of Ghana Export Promotion Authority and has been honored for her contribution towards the export sector uh, and Ghana's development at the fifth Ghana, Ghana Women of Excellence Awards. Dr. Asari has been uh, cited uh, and touted for her remarkable work in Ghana's exports. Under her leadership at GEPA, uh, GEPA was able to increase export revenue by 10% in 2018. And in 2019, she implemented initiatives to help reduce youth unemployment and make Ghana's export industry more attractive towards youth um, Dr. Asari, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for Thank having you, me. Thank you, Nana. Thank you, Nana. My nephew is also Nana Asari, also yeah. a professor in a university in Iowa. In Iowa, wow. <laughs> a lot about coincidental things. You will have to figure mm -hmm. out whether we're related yeah. some way, somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to allow you to talk a little bit more about your role at GEPA and what your objectives and your missions were are currently, and then obviously the impact COVID-19 has had on your work. So Ghana Export Promotion Authority is, the, is an agency of the Ministry of Trade and Industry mandated to export non-traditional um, services and products um, onto the international market. So you have everything apart from cocoa in its raw form, oil, minerals, and timber, which we don't um, handle, but everything else, that value has been added to, we need to push onto the international market. That's what GEPA does. And I serve GEPA. That's amazing. That's a huge goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a huge role to be played. How, how um, big is your staff there? Um, and how are they currently working in this new environment? A little over um, 100, if you are the national service personnel. Yeah. Right now, um, we have structured it in such a way that all the national service persons are home. Those who haven't taken their vacations have been asked to take their vacations. So we work with a skeletal staff and we run some kind of system so that we are not crowded in the office space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously everybody's wearing uh, oh, the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. So, excellent. So shifting back on the discussion of, of uh, business, in 2019, you introduced new initiatives to help reduce youth unemployment. And in the current uh, pandemic, how, do, how has this affected some of those plans that you had um, laid out for youth unemployment? Um, if you want to address that a little bit. You, you know that COVID-19 has affected everything. Our plans, um, our plans were to have the youth attached to exporters and then some of the farmers and um, growers of our products. So we had a competition. We, we selected a few of, of the young people to attach to these industries. But because of the situation, we are unable to, today I find um, the approval for all the, the, the young men and women to be attached to the various organizations and, and exporters, but I don't know how soon we can ask them to join these organizations. That is something that we have done and we are waiting to be able to send them out there. And I hope that very soon the, the restrictions will be lifted a bit for us to do that. So we are ready and the exporters are ready to receive them. That's awesome, that is very encouraging. And so within this um, uh, attachment that the youth are doing, um, yeah. what are some of the benefits for them uh, or what are some of the outcomes that you hope that they would get 
after they've completed their attachment. So take for example, those who are interested in farming, um, we are attaching them to farmers and they'll be given a piece of, um, a parcel of land to themselves to cultivate what they want to export. And this will be re-putting them through the processes, the training, um, all that they need to, to know and understand when it comes to the e export ecosystem. So they will farm, they will harvest. I mean, they will have to understand the products that they will be um, planting, the, the seedlings, everything about it. So the whole value chain, so the export packaging, design, everything. So they will be attached to this, this organization for about six months. And then when they pass out, we know they are ready to have their own businesses and, and, and export. And then we will help them to, to start. That's awesome. I certainly want to commend you and your team for implementing such a program because the youth, as we all know, are our future. We have the largest uh, youth uh, base or population in the entire world. And so this is in, a way in which we can ensure that their futures are set to enter the world. Yeah. Um, following on that discussion, with the economies of developed countries being bombarded by COVID-19, what opportunities do you, do you think there are for African, uh, Africa or African businesses to step up during this particular environment? What opportunities do you see that I think it's about time that we looked inward. We, we started trading amongst ourselves in Africa. We are always looking towards the Western, you know, but with 1.2 billion people, no better place to start trading than in Africa. We don't do a lot of business in Africa. If we take, for instance, um, within Africa last year, about 30% of our trade um, in Africa, it was so minimal. I don't even want to mention it. I feel bad. But we want <laughs> we want to we want to change all of that. So we've started working with our colleagues um, in the continent. So I talk to my colleagues in other countries, especially the ECOWAS countries. We we trade very well with Burkina Faso for some reason. They buy from us a lot more than any other country in, in, in Africa and in West Africa. So we, we, we trade, nice yeah, we trade with Nigeria. We want to we want to scale all of that up. Um, we don't only um, export products. We have also diversified into services. So we are looking at education. We are looking at the health sector. You know. So um, about a couple of months ago, before COVID, we had had a fair in Nigeria. We've gone to three states in Nigeria, showcasing what we have by way of education in Ghana. And this is what we are trying to do on the continent. Ethiopia is waiting for us to come. Rwanda has asked us to come. So um, gradually, if this whole animal of COVID is, um, slaughtered and buried somewhere, we will find our way out um, on the continent again, trying to sell what we have, trading in Africa and amongst ourselves. We think that's the way to go. And although it may be bad, it has brought all these, um, on, on, um, all these hardships on us. I think the positive side of it is that we are beginning to rediscover what we can do. We are doing things differently and it's going to be interesting because we are all looking inward now. We are looking to Africa. We are looking to work in, in Africa because we can see that we can do so many things. Um, things that we were importing from China, suddenly yeah. we have seen that we have the capacity and ability to get them done here. And so it's going to be interesting times yet. I, I am so optimistic. That is going to be interesting. Yeah. If you have, if really you have, have to hear that. by June, somebody says we will all die by June. So if we are not all dead by yeah. June, it's going to be very interesting. I, I love your sense of humor. I, I heard that quote in the. I too have. <laughs> it's totally. <laughs> <laughs> 
found that to be very comical. Um, on that note, what role do you think the African free trade, continental uh, free trade agreement will have on this environment? I know that, you know, obviously the Secretariat has been set up in, in Accra. We're all excited about that. Um, this is a huge plan, I think a 50, 60 year plan that is uh, trying to integrate the entire continent. Do you think COVID-19 will have accelerated some of the initiatives um, or do you think it'll take a back turn uh, knowing that people are closing, nations are closing their borders? What are you I think, think um, COVID-19 is just a blip in this whole affair of the EFCTFA. You know, this is the building. I'm sitting right in the okay. building. My office is situated right in the building that is going to house the EFCTFA. So I feel so good about that already. Um, I think that... Um, it's 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 a it's a good thing that we have decided to integrate the whole continent. We have decided to trade amongst ourselves, and this COVID nineteen is not going to draw us back or anything. It it may delay certain um, um, projects, or it may delay the start. But when we start, we are going to take off. I'm I'm so sure that we are going to start on a strong footing. Because as I said, um, although we are in abnormal times, we are still talking amongst ourselves and we know what we're going to do as soon as um, AFCTFA starts. The headquarters building is ready, everything is in place. Every day I see the work that is going on upstairs, getting everything ready for work to resume. So I know that this is just a blip and everything is going to be okay. That is awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Prabhupada Boateng, I say do um, ask the same type of question with the inception of COVID-19, how will this pandemic affect the African continental free trade area? I think you've already addressed that. Prabhupada, thank you so much for your question. Um, what I wanted to ask is, since that secretariat is going to be right next to your office, how do you see your office playing a role or working hand in hand with the AFCTA? Um, now Ghana is a commercial city, um, Accra is a commercial city of um, Africa, so it feels good. And because I'm close, I'm sure that I'll be able to communicate with them um, faster than the next door country, maybe Togo will be or Nigeria will be, and I'll take advantage of that. I will milk it mm. and make sure that Ghana is um, taking advantage of all the protocols and everything that will make us showcase our product, uh, products and services on the international market. Excellent, excellent. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what would you say some of our top five or so um, products of export currently are right now? I know individuals can look them up, but on the ground, I, I think you see a, a greater, uh, a greater, how should I say, uh, you see it more value, right? You see firsthand what is being exported and what the demand is. What would you say those products or services would be, Dr. Top of my head, I'll say shea butter. Mm -hmm. Shea butter, I'll say coconut, um, cashew. Um, we are talking about five. Yeah. Um, mango. Mango, oh, wow. Yes, mangoes, vegetables, vegetables, yes. And um, if I have to talk about the bigger things, let's talk about pharmaceuticals. Our pharmaceuticals are going places now. A lot of the um, African countries are importing from us. So pharmaceuticals, and the president is really keen on making sure that we produce a lot more to, to, to export. So there's a huge investment in pharmaceuticals. Anybody who is interested in going into pharmaceuticals um, will be helped greatly by the government to do that. Oh, that's yeah. very interesting to know. Thank you so much for that. Uh, entrepreneurs that are out there, you heard it from Dr. Osari herself. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is a huge area of need and certainly an area of, um, of um, that has been identified as a focal point for the government. So. Make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, following along with that, um, there has been more than 200,000 
or so micro, small, and medium enterprises that are expected to benefit from about what's reported to be about 600 million Ghana CDs um, called the COVID-19 Alleviation Program Business Support Scheme. When, when do you think these type of uh, schemes will be available? And do you think there will be any sort of an eligibility and tax to that? Um, any thoughts as to that? Is that? Does your office know anything about that particular program? It doesn't sit with my office, but my office is pre is preparing the exporters who might need the, the support. And so I'm working closely with the National Board for Small Scale um, Industries, NBSSI, which is the agency that is handling the stimulus package. So we are preparing our exporters who may need some support. And, and we will offload these people to NBSSI to support. So be, before before we send the look to M, M, NBSSI, they have to be registered with us. We have to know really they need the support and what they are going to use it for because we will be um, monitoring how they use um, the support that will be given them. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Richard Okoku says, please add frozen natural yam chips. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's very important. We we support yam as well. We've made a lot of intervention in yam. And we think that it will be very good for some people to blast freeze yam chips for export. But before mm. they yes, so that instead of potato chips and all of that, you can buy yam tips and normally when the yam is exported sometimes it gets to the other side and it's um, it's going back so it would be very good if it can be you know made into chips and you know you blast freeze and export and we we, we welcome those who are interested in doing that we welcome them to do that and they will have our support at get back excellent excellent i'm a huge fan of yams uh, especially the fried yam and uh, that is a concern. Yam market. My my father, by the way, is a is the president and CEO of a of a um, African grocery chain in uh, mm -hmm. that area called Asaka Market. And yeah. these are some of the challenges that these grocers have had for years and years. Exporting yams from Ghana. By the time mm -hmm. it gets here, right. a good thirty percent is done back. And so mm -hmm. we certainly sympathize with that. Um, Here's another question we have uh, from Anansi, uh, Anansi Digital Hub. It says, hi, Dr. Asari. Historically, trade between Africa and USA has not been that strong. Have you recently been engaged in any project that seeks to change that dimension? Can you ask that again? Okay, sure. It says, hi, Dr. Asari. Historically, trade okay. between Africa and USA has not been that strong. Have you recently been engaged in any project that seeks to change that dimension? You know, we have the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, which is called AGOA. That yes. is um, America, yeah, our trade between um, um, us and America, where we can send certain items to um, the U.S. tariff free. A lot, about 65 um, of them. I can't, I can't even mention all of them here, but textiles, food, you name it. You can send these to America um, tariff free. A lot of people are not even taking advantage of it, and we have made, you know, we've had, we've had several for us on this Agoa, and we haven't even scratched the surface. We've got less than five years to go on this, so I will encourage everybody who wants to do business in 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 America between Ghana and America to talk to us. Let us introduce you to the Agoa if you don't know anything about it and the the full stops or products or services that we can send tariff free. You know, the, the Chinese people even take advantage of it to come here and produce so that they will not have to pay tariff and export it from here to America tariff free. And so we're we not have, taking No, we're not taking advantage of it. We haven't even done anything. We have a lot to do by way of trade between us and America. Thank you for that information. We certainly Yeah, we're going to definitely uh, promote that message so uh, we, very shortly throughout we, our various chambers uh, to our members. Okay. We, in our own little way, to 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 
um, entice people to export to America. We are working on getting, um, um, what do you call it, um, warehouses, warehouses in certain states in the U.S. so that people will feel encouraged to even export and, and, and keep them in our warehouses for onward distribution in the U.S. This is one of the few things we are trying to do to encourage people to export to the U.S. Awesome. Um, Lucy had a question, um, Lucy Dutson and, uh, and George, I want to bring Lucy's question back. She says, so last year there were talks about the export developmental uh, development plan. Could you shed some more light on this given the current pandemic and will the target of $5 billion still be achieved in 2021, the export developmental plan? The export development plan, the national export development plan, we call it, um, was put together by organizations and persons in the export ecosystem in Ghana. So it involved about a hundred organizations and it's a very, very solid document that we were excited about just when we were about to um, launch and implement um, COVID happened. But we, nevertheless, we have started implementing certain aspects of it, but we need cabinet assent to it, to start implementing it fully. But we are implementing the, the aspects that we think we can uh, in between time, waiting for the go ahead to fully implement it, which will not only involve Ghana Export Promoting Authority, but all the agencies and organizations that are involved in exports in the country. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that answer. Uh, George Amayel says or asks, what do you see as the biggest challenge post COVID-19 in the export sector in Ghana? Uh, that's from George Amayel. Um, the biggest challenge. I don't know why George will come and ask me this question. <laughs> I, I, take it, I take it you know George. Yes, I do. <laughs> me. <laughs> but really, um, we 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 have a couple of challenges, but I think we can work we can work around them. We need to think about how we will do things going forward from now. Already, we are really interested in going into e-commerce, which I think is what is going to be now and training our people to be able to sell online as well, because it's not going to be business as usual. I'm thinking of how we are going to expose them to expo, the expos and the fairs that we go, how is traveling going to be and all that. So it's about time we encourage them to start um, trading online. We have been working with them online a lot. We have a training through the Ghana, um, export promoting training to the export school and we train some of the exporters and they all come through most of them come through our school to become seasoned exporters we think that that is even going to happen more online already we are very good when it comes to um, the it um, space because we even won an award for the best use of it at the wtpo um, in France in 2018. So we are already on top of that, but we think that's what is, it's going to be. That's the way to go. Um, technology is going to take over. But then we will also look at how um, the interactions are going to be with the other countries, how we are going to attend our fairs and take our stuff there and all of that. It's not going to be easy. I know it's, a, it's going to be a big challenge, but... Um, we will survive. Yeah. It sounds like we have the right person in charge to, uh, to tackle such a problem. So yeah. we wish you all the best. And anything that we can do on this side to help you out, we certainly will be doing that. And uh, we'll continue some of our discussion because we are very much interested in working with your, with your outfit sector of our nation. Um, yeah. Here's a question that was presented um, in our discussions. There seems to be an opportunity or the need to be able to register with the Ghana Export Promotion Authority. How do you, um, how does one go about registering with the uh, 
GEPA? And then also, what is the process entail? Um, you can visit our website. Everything is out there on our website. But basically, if you are here, you just walk through of our offices. We have offices in 10 regions of Ghana, um, in eight regions. Now we have 16 regions. We are thinking of how we are going to go into all the regions. But in eight regions of Ghana, you can find um, Ghana Export Promotion Authority. You can walk into our offices and, and register. It's, it's just a little token to register. And we will require a few documents from you. And even if you don't have the documents, we will help you get those documents so that you can register. And then you will benefit from us. Because when we expose you to the market, we take you on force. We pay for the freighting of your goods. The government pays for the freighting of your goods. The government pays for the booth that you, you display. All you have to do is to take you there, get your accommodation, and then just go to the fairgrounds. Everything will be sorted out for you. So they, awesome. they, they, they organize business meetings for them, you know. We expose you and your products to the world without you paying so much, but just yeah. being available. Yeah. Great information. Thank you for sharing that. Um, looks like uh, Letitia Archery Darkos says, thank you, Dr. Asabia. Regarding AGOA, people need to be reminded, I would encourage. Um, and since the flood of returnees to Ghana has started, you just have to keep reminding people. So I think this is more of an advice or a suggestion as opposed to a, uh, a question. Um, that Thank is from Letitia Archie Dark. Thank you, Letitia. Excellent. Well noted. Excellent, excellent. So um, as we, I feel like we could talk forever because you're providing such useful information. Um, a couple of questions before we, we, we close out. When it relates, as it relates to uh, intra-Africa trade, how are our policies, how can they be sort of, I don't know how to explain, maybe improved? I know that we have some strong policies in place, but what areas would you say that we need to improve in our intra-trade policy um, to really, really beef up our export sector? In what ways can we improve that? We have, we've had some challenges. We've, we've had some challenges. Now people are trying to protect um, their, their, their products and all of that. Yeah, pe pe people do that. But um, I think with the Africa, um, the after, oh, yeah, it, it confuses me sometimes. AFDFA. Mm -hmm. Some of the protocols will need to be looked at and enforced. It's sometimes even difficult for you to take something to Nigeria. Mm. So we are talking about Africa now when we can't even cross borders into Nigeria and Togo and Benin. And so how are we going to integrate the whole of the continent? Then? It becomes very difficult. We still have some challenges and we are always going to the border to you know, battle it out to, to get our, our products into other African countries. So I think that with, with the um, AFCTFA, um, certain things will be streamlined. And I, I, I am optimistic that um, it's in the right direction. We've, we've, we've had difficulties, but we will resolve these difficulties. We have to. It's a must. Otherwise, we, we, we're going nowhere. Things we have decided that we are going to trade amongst ourselves. Excellent. So we're not getting rid of you. You're obviously here to stay. We have, uh, we'll continue to have you on, so please. Um, what would be some practical, three practical tips that you would like to share with African business owners to help expand, to help them expand post COVID-19? What would be some of your three advice or tips, if you would? They should take technology seriously. Um, they should look at selling online. They should look at, um, I always talk about packaging, packaging, packaging. It's very, very important. And they should cut down on expenditure. If you don't have what it takes, cut down on expenditure. And um, you need the essentials now. So you have to cut down on expenditure. Keep your ears to the ground and look for opportunities that may present around this season of COVID. 
and um, use this time to improve upon yourself, build your capacity. Mm. A lot of people have time on their hands now. Yeah. So build on your capacity, improve upon yourself while you plan for after COVID. Life is going to be before COVID and after COVID. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be fine now. Yeah. Uh, please do stay on with us. We're going to bring our next uh, speaker. But before we do that, a uh, final question from Pramab Boateng as Sidhu. He says, is Africa the next European Union? Hmm, interesting question. I don't know how you would uh, like to tackle that. But yeah, again, is Africa the next European Union? <laughs> <laughs> he knows the answer. <laughs> All right, Dr. Ellis, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ellis, sorry, Dr. Asari, thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to bring on um, Ellis Hubbard, uh, who's Houston based and is also an entrepreneur, and um, going to bring him into this discussion. Ellis, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Let me give a, a brief introduction to uh, uh, about you to our audience. And so that they can know uh, who you are, and then you can tell us a little bit more. Anything else that you'd like to share before we get started? So, um, Mr. Ellis Hubbard is a CEO of Short Street Strategic Solutions LLC. He's a former board of director for the Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, welcome, Ellis. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role in the business community here in Houston? Sure. Thank you once again for the invitation. Um, I've learned a ton just uh, in the first couple of speakers, and uh, I definitely look forward to uh, what we can all do as a uh, larger transatlantic team going forward. Um, so Short Street Strategic Solution was a company I started back in 2016. It is a marketing and sales company. Uh, because my background is heavy, uh, 25 years in marketing and sales and uh, sales training. My idea was there's a lot of folks like me who are uh, independent sales reps who wanted to connect with small business owners in the community and help them grow uh, with an emphasis uh, initially on um, black owned businesses emphasis. and, uh, and uh, minority owned businesses. Uh, sorry if you're getting some feedback. Um, and so our idea was to partner with some of our independent sales reps and then provide them with opportunities uh, with small businesses. And we've done that uh, on uh, some smaller projects. Uh, I've taken on uh, myself and my wife have taken on different projects ourselves to try to build a platform of sales reps who connect with business owners who are focused on doing what they do, building their widgets and then having the sales reps do what they do, which is market those products and services. So we're uh, in the midst of growing this company and continuing to make it bigger. Now, uh, for three years, I also served on the board of the Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce because uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I love the chamber. I'm still a member uh, and want to continue to, now that I'm off the board, see how I can connect the chamber, the, black, the Greater Houston Black Chamber, with uh, definitely the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and other uh, African um, Houston-based chambers to try to be the connector and, uh, between all these organizations so we can grow forward. I have my own vision uh, for what that looks like and, and hopefully it coincides and we try to share this and, and, and make it a much larger trade-based, economically aggressive and forward-thinking community. That's an excellent, excellent vision. I really, really like that. Um, what uh, Two things. One is that uh, we are very much interested in speaking to you uh, about how to link the chambers uh, together, both the Ghana Houston Chamber of uh, Commerce as well as the Texas West African Chamber of Commerce uh, to the Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce. It looks like it's a, a long overdue discussion that we need to have uh, ASAP. Uh, the second part is that uh, as you were talking about your training, your sales and training background, it, it seems like uh, it would be a great platform for you to uh, interact with Dr. Uh, Asari and her group uh, to ch help train some of those exporters over there in terms of what we are looking for. Something that we I always uh, marvel at is how do you know what the other side wants if you haven't even talked to them yet? How do you know how to mm -hmm. sell to them if you 
we don't, you know, th these are the type of things, because Americans are a little different when it comes to products and services and how they're perceived, right? So um, maybe sure. there should be a, a discussion about uh, how the two groups can help each other in terms of training so that we can really help boost the export and the business on this side. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely, I agree. Um, marketing here in the States to um, to anyone is, is, is definitely based uh, in my mind in a, a couple of different fashions here in 2020. Number one, it's uh, cultural based. So you have to be able to uh, understand what your product is and how it serves a specific segment of society. You know, definitely marketing, um, that marketing milk to, you know, one segment of society may look totally different as in the other. Black folks may want, you know, don't get me wrong, black folks may want chocolate milk and other groups may want, uh, you know, uh, different type of milk. You just have to understand that and, and not be um, judgmental in a sense and understand what's the goal. The goal is to move your product and, and the goal is to put your product in the hands of the customers that you think need it most. Um, so I would say, yes, it's long overdue. We do some type of collaborative uh, training on just what marketing looks like in 2020 uh, and that it is very culturally sensitive. And then the second um, thing about marketing here in the States is just understanding that you need to be the big fish in a small pond. You know, don't try to come in and sell to everybody. You know, that's just not how it works. You know, find the group that will buy your product and then be the biggest fish in that pond. Um, you know, make sure that you communicate with them the way that they communicate with you, whether that's social media or whether that's a newsletter, may, may, whether that's, you know, in person at fairs. And, uh, you know, I've seen a ton of very successful businesses that they don't have a retail shop. They don't necessarily have a large online presence, but they may be at health food fairs or uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, community uh, fairs, and they're making just as much money and and as anyone else, you know, so to speak. And so it's just a way to understand who your market is and how you market to them to get your product sold. So definitely, uh, I'm open to to assisting or even um, helping facilitate you know training in that manner. Excellent, Dr. Asari. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, does that um, interest you? Uh, I know this is right on the spot, but but what are your thoughts on, on to that question of linking um, trainings, especially uh, sales training towards the uh, Ghanaian exporter for the American market or for the overseas market? What are your thoughts on that? Important. Your microphone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's important because you cannot just decide that I'm exporting to the U.S. when the, ma the market is not there for you. You must understand the market. You must understand. You may you may think that everybody likes a particular thing in Ghana. So oh, even when they come from the US and they visit us, they like it. So I'm taking it there. I'm exporting it there. That's not how they may want it over there. They may want it packaged different way. They may want it tasted differently from slightly differently from how it is tasted here. So you have to study the market. You need to know the market. So it is very good when we collaborate like this. We get to understand um, the taste of the market that we want to penetrate. It is only fair that we work together to understand that. We may not sit here and understand everything. Absolutely. Only we get to know that market very well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I feel a partnership growing, so I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to have made that connection. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a, another question. <laughs> um, what um, new ideas is this pandemic giving you surrounding business, right? We, we all, I know, waking, sleeping, we all are thinking about new things that we can do now. What are some of your ideas in this new environment? So I'm going to answer that in two parts. One is, is very personal. A um, long time ago, I made the decision that I wanted to be in a business or uh, when I'm back, I was working, you know, um, uh, in working for corporate America. I wanted to be an opportunity where I was flex, I had the flexibility to work from at the time home. Now it's to work from wherever, and so I made a conscious decision as we build, started building our business that we would be very flexible. We wouldn't have a physical location. Now, obviously, it, that's not necessarily something that everyone can do, depending on the, the product you have. But I won't say that I had the foresight to see that stuff like this would happen and force folks to work from home. But I definitely, 
you know, thought about as you try to grow a business, you look at the capital that you invest in it, the capital expenditures that you're, you know, you're putting out. And if one of those can be lessened, then my profit margin can be much higher. And so if I don't need to have an office, why, why rent one? You know, why uh, spend that money on them? If my employees, if the people I contract with don't need to physically be in front of me to do their work and for us to make money, then then why um, make that happen? You know, you all probably heard the uh, Twitter city CEO uh, this morning say that uh, from now on, from forever, uh, Twitter employees can elect to work from home. I think that that's the next biggest step. If we take a silver lining out of what COVID-19 and the coronavirus has taught us in terms of business owners is that we have to be ready to do business however we can to continue to provide our products and services um, to, to our customers. You know, and to be flexible is the number one thing that I think uh, is most important out of this, you know, this time that we're going through now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, following along with, on these discussions on that topic, um, what, what would what do you think African American businesses could bring to, to the continent of Africa uh, in order to help build a sustainable economy, um, especially in this new environment? You know, there's always that discussion. Uh, 2019 yeah. was great yeah. year for year of return, the excitement, the renaissance, the resurgence, all those relatives, right? Uh, what can those in the diaspora here do to help? Uh, the continent grow and develop uh, in this particular environment. What are your thoughts on that? Um, absolutely. We need African American businesses to number one understand not just the business climate in countries in Africa, but to understand that we are a major and integral part of its next phase of growth. And you know, you look at the statistics and you see. Um, that there are millions of black owned businesses here in the states the majority of them and we at the chamber we did a study a few years ago the majority of these businesses are home-based business okay that's number one the majority of them only earn you know 50 to 100 thousand dollars a year so they're not very big businesses so guess what that means it does mean that we're not you know savvy business owners. It just means that we need to understand there's a whole continent worth of customers that look just like us that we need to be marketing to, that we can provide services for, that we can provide a, um, let's say, a transatlantic um, trade that benefits us and doesn't take us away from our roots like it did 400 years ago. Uh, and so that's the next phase for African-American businesses here is to realize, you know what, if I'm going to go into business, I can be international and I can be international immediately. And there's a whole uh, continent worth of folk who want what I can provide. And I need to be aggressive uh, in pursuing that and also being open to uh, being a conduit for African businesses to sell products here. I mean, if you can imagine a, uh, uh, a FedEx, for if you will, or a, uh, a UPS, if you will, that is uh, based around African American and African uh, continental businesses that trade back and forth. I mean, that to me, that's our next level. And trust you, I've been working on it and will continue to work with anyone who wants to, to make that a reality. That is a fascinating topic because what you're talking about, the infrastructure so that those services can actually be um, to, could be had. Without the infrastructure in place, you can't have it. So the first step is Absolutely. building the infrastructure. So I commend you for that thought process. And um, certainly I will be talking to you about that as well. Um, we have a, a, a question here from Philomena Apia. Um, this is not directed to Ellis. I'm hoping that Ellis will get some questions, but it is directed towards Dr. Asari. It says, ask Dr. Asari, where in USA do they have the, the warehouses? So, um, Dr. Asari, I'm not sure if you want to address that question. Well, yeah. I said we were working on that, and presently we are almost um, through with negotiations on one in New Jersey. New Jersey. So... Yeah. Excellent. Would you guys uh, consider one here in Houston, Texas, 
uh, because certainly we are here to help you and assist you in any way that we can in making Houston, Texas a sister, sister city city to Accra um, and certainly the number one destination. I'm not saying that the New Jersey is not a good place. Uh, certainly have family there, but I want to make sure that Houston is also uh, in consideration as a destination. We have to start from somewhere. <laughs> we have to, that's going to be the first one. So definitely, America is a huge market. So we start from somewhere. We get to Houston next. Excellent. 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 Absolutely. Right, um, we're ready for you. So, uh, Ella, maybe you want to take this question. It says this is also. It says is is if Africa is empowered, all black people will be empowered all over the world. So how do we bridge the gap between specifically black businesses in the U.S. and Africa, and where do we start? Brother, you want to uh, take on that tough yeah. question? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I love this question because it has a, a, a lot of different layers. We're not going to try to address all of them right now. But um, this last part, where do we start? Okay, we start by if you're not a member of your local uh, trade organizations like the Chambers of Commerce, especially um, the Great Houston Black Chamber is, is one, um, but don't just stop there and join one chamber. Join uh, the Ghana Chamber of Commerce, uh, join the Nigerian Chamber of Commerce, and join them with the purpose of actually bridging and forming your own individual business relationships that you can actually be an exporter of your service if you're an African-American business here in the States, and also if you're an exporter, if you're on the other side and an importer. So that's the, the thought process. Get around the your customer base, get around your peers who are um, uh, African based businesses so that we can begin the discussion so that we're not you know, steady talking about what we're going to do. But we're actually doing it, you know, and those uh, associations provide um, a great format to begin discussions. Now, you can also go to your uh, local uh, legislatures and your, uh, especially your federal reps, and speak to them about again. You know, we mentioned uh, the AGOA uh, Act earlier, but also speaking about legislations that can actually promote providing loans and interest-free loans specifically to Black-owned businesses who are exporting, who are performing and creating logistics-based companies excuse me, to provide more services um, to the, di the African diaspora. So that's one of the things we can do. Join those organizations and then also talk to your uh, federal rep and make sure they're on the same page with you about promoting interest-free loans. Excellent, thank you for that advice. Um, we're gonna bring on our next uh, speaker because we are a little bit uh, rushed for time, but uh, we're, we're doing okay, I think we're gonna be fine. Um, so at this point, I'd like to uh, welcome in Adum Dennis. Uh, Adum, if you are nearby, if you could join us. Uh, there he is. He's coming. Hey, Adum, how are you? Very thank you, and good evening to you all. Uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. Uh, very, very interesting points uh, from Dr. Asari. Um, so I'm Adam Dennis. I currently in the UK, and that's where I've actually spent most of my career. Uh, spent about 15 years within the buying sector, uh, buying for some of the biggest uh, retail companies in the UK, and turning over the best part of uh, 1.5 billion dollars a year. Uh, so I have very extensive buying experience across the board, uh, buying from every country that you can ever think of. Uh, we've also set up um, a company called Morales Africa uh, just last year. Uh, Morales Africa started from a very interesting place. So uh, I worked with a company about eight years ago uh, called Stella Polaris. And Stella Polaris is actually one of the most the biggest and probably most advanced companies that produces uh, uh, shell uh, prawns in the world. Um, but actually, when I visited this company uh, about eight, ten years ago, one of the biggest challenges that they had was um, what they do with the, uh, the, the, the bits that people don't want. So everybody wanted to uh, cook and peel prawn, nobody wanted the shells, nobody wanted uh, the heads. 
funny enough, that's my best part, actually. I prefer the shells to the heads. Uh, but they were throwing away the equivalent mm -hmm. of 5 million mm -hmm. kilos of prawns every year away. So they did a lot of reinvestment and a lot of research into what they could do with the shells. And uh, after 5 million euros later, uh, they came up with a product which is probably and actually the world's first blood pressure reducing medication out of these shells. It's patented and, and it's one of the products that we're going to look at launching uh, as Morales Africa. We're actually going to be based in Ghana, so it's good to know. And uh, we're going to be exporting all the way into Africa. We have a group of products that we will be bringing on as time goes on. So it's really interesting to hear uh, Dr. Sari talk about the, the pharmaceutical uh, aspect. It's actually been clinically tested. Um, being, it's received approvals from Health Canada, FDA, USA, and the European Union already. And we are working with some of the brightest doctors in, in Ghana in the classic center uh, to make sure that when we start looking at the specifics whether there's any genetic uh, variations within that we we cut that as part of the as part of the project I mean uh, Morales AS which is based is very very sportive and they're looking at really doing a lot of investment to make sure that we kind of make Ghana the hub but also to export uh, wider into, into the into the into wider African continent. I think for today, uh, the the bit that I can add to the discussion in, in a bit more detail is around the buying. So you talk about selling. Uh, Dr. Sari talked about how we can open up the markets and create the enablers. But I sit at a very sharp end of everything, where. I sit down and I actually make decisions with the rest of my team and the business units that I manage to actually spend $1.5 billion every single time. So we'll be interested as we go through some of the questions that come through to look at some of the some of the very easy mistakes that we make uh, in so far within the food industry uh, and also uh, some of the very easy learnings that we can take uh, and to be able to compete uh, on a level fit footing in uh, some of the bigger uh, bigger competitors that sit out there. Excellent. Adam, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I uh, wanted to ask you the qu this question surrounding uh, COVID-19. COVID how has your business impacted and how has it actually impacted by Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sorry. So the question is, in this era of COVID-19, how has your business been affected by the pandemic? And then also African trade, uh, what challenges do you see in this particular environment? Right. So the... the COVID-19 has completely changed the way people buy food. There would have been some categories which I call, uh, uh, let's say the cupboard ingredients category, which historically would have been um, Climbing category. So, if you think about what we used to do or what your mother used to, to cook with 20, 30 years ago, there were all the long life products. There will be the flour, the, the, uh, there will be the canned foods and all that that you would use uh, in the past that has become in in within the re recent times uh, a declining 
Because people were getting fresh and they were getting fresh and they were getting it on leader products. Because if you want minutes, uh, but also certain areas of fresh didn't quite well because of the some of the time scales. So there's been in a whole, whole upheaval in an area where you used to sell 10, you're suddenly selling a thousand. So there's a big challenge um, in, in, in the industry uh, re reshaping the way we buy because it's not, the, the customers have completely changed with products that they didn't use to engage in, but also making sure that once we, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, so, all, many products have completely changed completely. So, we're seeing big, big things coming through products and very, very little coming through on products that would have not been there. <clears throat> For, for the Africa market uh, generally, I think some of the uh, with, um, borders closing may mean that we need to significantly look at how we find creative solutions. We're not going to wait for mm -hmm. things to go back to normal. They will fill their shelves, and it would mean that it needs to be done very, very quickly. Excellent. Thank you so much for that feedback. Um, at this point, I want to ask a few questions that are related um, I don't, to your, uh, you know, things that you've learned, some of the big, big take home messages that you've learned in setting up your business and doing business in Africa. What would you say those are? Some of the big take home messages that you really learned? I think. The, one of the biggest things that I've learned is that people do not understand the customer. So, perception that once you can do it, you have the right. Answer. That is probably one of the biggest misconceptions out there. They're always going to be there. The buyers are always going to take the decisions, but the buyers take the decisions based on what the customer needs. So, where it's that you are uh, it out there, just make sure that you understand the customer very well but also you understand exactly how you're going to market that product. Without that understanding, then it's absolutely pointless. So that's a really key thing. I think the other thing to also to, to expect is that we have a world that is changed at net break speed. So if you look at some of the industries that have come and gone, um, even in some of the technology sector, you look at more you know, like that, Phone is probably less than 50 years old, but significantly in every single year. Then businesses has to think about how you change and adapt and compete and become relevant within the space every single time. And without the ability to change and adapt, struggle significantly when we get into the market. I think. Within Africa as well, and especially in, in a lot of the markets, people tend to want to copy. So a friend of his is selling, let's say, yam chips. He goes in and tries to sell yam chips. All you're doing is actually halving the opportunity. Uh, actually, if you wish him well and you go, can I actually transport your yam chips? Then suddenly you try and create value for him. You make his work easier, and actually you create a bit bigger business. Um, and probably the last probably add is that the opportunity in Africa is there. It's so frustrating sometimes to see African business trying to make it and not being able to make it. It's there. It's so glaring. We just need to try and ask the right questions. And there is a lot of hope for African businesses. We just need to start thinking about the customer a lot more 
rather than the buyer, rather than the free stuff that I, will, I call enablers, that the likes of Dr. Asari will try and put in place to how the trade actually goes on. There is a lot more we can do, and we should be actually pushing for it. And when it comes to um, some of the area of um, innovation, we should always, uh, like Dr. Sarsari actually mentioned, we should always be at the top end of the innovation. I go through and just about, let's say two, three months ago, I needed to review uh, about half a billion worth of, of sales uh, from my suppliers. And if you look at some of the innovation coming through, it's it's sign loads of NDA, and you look at that, and you go, my goodness, people have absolutely no idea what's actually going around the corner. Uh, and uh, that understanding makes a big difference. I'll give you a few examples. When you look at, when you don't understand the market, then that producing just for producing sake, uh, you look at things like potatoes, common potatoes, and you probably compare that to yams. It takes about eight years to develop a variety. So someone is out there developing a variety for eight years, you probably pick any variety and you grow anything that you can compete. You be out of flow with, with, without, uh, without, within a very few minutes. Uh, but also one of the things that African business don't do very well, and I gave you the, the example of uh, Morales, is that we look at a product as if it's the end product and that's it. If you think about the way any business within the United Kingdom would treat, let's say, can uh, potatoes or anything, every bit of it is being used. So when the pig is killed, the head goes somewhere, the bristles go somewhere, the, the crackling goes somewhere, the feet probably might end up in Africa in brine, uh, but every bit of it is and that is what actually allows uh, some of these uh, suppliers to actually gain the competitive advantage over other bits. So I believe, for instance, the work that we're doing with Morales would also mean that actually they are able to even harder when it comes to prawns. That five million kilos of prawns that was actually going into the bin now is able to make a uh, precardix, which is the, 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 the drug that I was talking about, is able to make some cubes, like the Maggi cubes that you're talking about, is able to make even the powders for shito and all that thing. So it, it creates trying to understand how you can almost exhaust every part of your product is probably one of the biggest opportunities that we, we need to look at. And maybe not trying to copy all the time, which is what one of the biggest uh, takes that I'll, I'll, I'll give. Excellent, excellent feedback. You guys have been more than I could ever uh, anticipate in terms of uh, your expertise and your input. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions that uh, we want to wrap up with, um, and uh, and then we'll go from there. So, in in closing, I think I've asked this question in, in a a good way, a different way. What would we'll start off with um, Dennis? What would be the three practical tips that you would share with those involved in supply chain demand and um, post COVID 19? Dennis, I think the, the key thing in terms of, yeah, I think change, change is definitely happening, and COVID 19 has just heightened the change that is happening. I think the best businesses will con would have to continue to provide solutions to the customer. And one of the most uh, is that when you start trading, get into the detail. Don't just export someone and almost hope for the best. Just get into the detail. Understand who your customer is and understand how they use the product. Because mm -hmm. that's the only way you're going to be able to add value to, to the end user. Awesome, awesome ideas. Thank you. The next question is for we're going in reverse here. So, um, Ellis, what would be the practical tips that you could uh, share with African American business uh, owners to make more 
um, and to support. You know what? I may have asked you that already, so let me scratch that and ask you a different type of question. And that is, um, how do you think the Greater Houston Black Chamber of Commerce or other associations in America can link up with African businesses? So thank you once again for this opportunity um, to collaborate on this webinar. And I'm uh, hopeful that this is the start of many more that we'll do as we grow this, um, uh, again, like the word, the term I use, transatlantic uh, communication hub and hopefully logistics hub. So what I will say is that join your chamber, uh, number one, if you're not a, a, a part of it, but then the chambers themselves uh, need to have uh, executive level communication on a uh, at least a monthly basis. And when I was a member of the board, we made you know several small attempts to do that. But I think that we need to start sharing data, you know, like the data that's been shared today, and put it front and center amongst the organization and associations, and and not do as much data gathering as individual organizations, but do them as collaborative organizations. So that we can see that, hey, here's the opportunities and here's how we take advantage of them. You know, uh, here's the banks that will support us that are uh, African American owned and African uh, owned banks that have the money to invest and are ready, are ready to invest. Here's the investment firms that we need to go to that we can point our member businesses to. Those are the types of strategic talks that I think our chambers of commerce and our business associations in the diaspora need to have um, as of yesterday, not tomorrow, not sometime, but right now. Thank you so much, Ellis. Um, we did have a, uh, uh, a member, one of the uh, webinar members uh, asked a question and it's directed towards Dennis. So I'll, uh, Dennis, if you could briefly answer this question for Andreas Semmingsen. Question for Mr. Dennis. How can uh, companies in Ghana and Africa build long-term partnerships and business relationships with European companies? Any thoughts there, Dennis? I think that's an important question. Um, for African, uh, Ghanaian, Ghanaian or African businesses build a long-term partnership, I think one of the key things is to have a common vision for the long-term. Um, if it's if you have a business that is purely based on where you can get here and now, then chances are you wouldn't have a common strategic plan for the long term. And that common strategic plan means that you have a joint vision together, you work uh, closely with each other, but also you make sure that you are very clear, both of you, with your objectives and have close relate to make sure that the benefits come on both sides. I think when one side wants to be the beneficiary and probably doesn't understand the objectives of the other side, then that's what actually creates uh, some of the challenges. I think when you work a lot more within Europe, you tend to find that all long-term relationships can be difficult at the, at the beginning, but when you have a joint business plan, but a joint vision, or a joint strategy together. That is the that is the surest way of of of, of making sure that you build uh, long term relationships. Uh, this question is for Dr. Asari. Dr. Asari, what do you think those of us in the diaspora can do? What suggestions would you have for us in terms of trying to help you and your team at GEPA? and uh, improving export and export relations. What would be some of the take home or the needs, high need areas um, in which you would seek our help from if you would? The certifications, the standards that are required because you may know the market, you may know what the market wants, but entering the market requires that you have to adhere to certain standards. You need to get certain um, certifications. And so those in the diaspora who know this can help. Now, that's why we need to do the training together. If you can help, um, then we need to do the training together to make our people understand what is required of us 
in certain markets that we want to penetrate. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is for uh, Mazda. Um, actually, we're getting a couple of comments here. Uh, I want to read a couple of them from our audience. It says, Ghana is privileged to have Ghana Export Promotion Authority. I entreat exporting farmers to have a relationship with GEPA because GEPA can improve you as an exporter. And I'm sure Dr. Asari can add to it. And so, yes, uh, somebody is uh, really, uh, George, uh, as you well know, is giving you uh, all the prop stuff. And um, this message here is from Philomena Apia. Philomena says, I think there should be a special bank that deals with the export market because most of our commercial banks are slow and expensive to deal with. Man, she hit on a huge, huge note there. And I know um, Ellis had some comments towards that. So I I'll shift that real quickly to Ellis before we move back to uh, Mazda. Ellis, would you want to share with us the idea, this explosive idea that you just had? Uh, that uh, would help address uh, Columbus' uh, question. But before, before that, can I say that there's a bank? There's a bank for export markets in Ghana. There's Exim Bank, Ghana Exim Bank, that deals with import and export and is helping a lot of exporters. Even within this COVID era, a lot of our exporters in the textile industry was helped by Exim to make all the masks that is being sold around and, and um, sent to all, all over the country it was by the support of Exim Bank. There's, there's the, um, a company here in Ghana that supplies a lot of um, clothing. Some of your designer clothing in the US come from Ghana, from a company called DTRT. And DTRT is being supported by both GEPA and Exim. And so we have a bank for exporters and importers as well. So Dennis, you can come in. Excellent. And so um, what I'm actually proposing is that we uh, figure out a way to, in 2020, create a $100 million startup fund that is managed by uh, no less than a, 10 investment banks that are African or African-American owned. And the reason why I'm proposing this like this, this way, is because if we want to see a growth in trade between African-American businesses and African businesses, one of the things we struggle with is not being credit worthy when it comes to the traditional white owned banks that are here in the States. Uh, when our business owners have applied. Uh, this is data that's you know readily available. So I'm not just you know speaking off off cuff. But I really feel like this is an opportunity for uh, African based banks to open up a new market for yourselves when it comes to not only our small businesses, but our startups and even our um, our regular citizens. You know if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's, let's open up to uh, every specific facet of the economy that we can to grow our businesses worldwide. And Excellent. Thank you. If, uh, and uh, we will talk off about that. If yeah, I may uh, add please. something. Go ahead, Maza. And um, one thing I would like to, to add would be, uh, you know, the, the, the African diaspora, uh, I believe uh, they have uh, easy access to funding when it's come to, uh, you know, investing and all that. So uh, I've been I've been saying that, you know, to my colleagues and and friends, say it would be great to have a, a some sort of like a regional platform, like a, a database for projects, right? Uh, and any any African any diaspora can just go in that database and then see the projects that are available uh, uh, to invest in in Africa. And, you know, since, I mean, the funding would not be uh, uh, a huge problem for, for, for African diaspora, once you go over there, you go, you know, you, you have access to uh, the platform, you can, you can see all the projects that are available in Africa. And then, you know, you can, you can decide whether or not you want to invest in that particular project. 
So, and but something I also want to add is we we have to encourage uh, African African American here to 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 go to Africa to travel to Africa to see what's going on over there because most of them uh, don't I don't want to say don't trust Africa but because of the image and uh, what has been said you know about the negative uh, 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 advertisement about Africa you know uh, they don't they don't they don't they don't go to Africa. They don't travel to Africa. And I love what Ghana Ghana has been doing. Uh, the year of return, uh, and uh, we have a lot of African Americans starting, you know, to go to Africa. And uh, I think we need more. If just imagine if uh, all the African countries start doing that, and you know, having uh, the African American here to travel to Africa and see what's going on over there, I think that would be great. Excellent, excellent. Uh, to the entire Guba team, thank you for hosting this particular webinar that is focused on COVID-19 and international trade, the impact on African businesses. I want to thank Dr. Asari, who is the CEO um, of GEPA. Um, I want to thank Mr. Ellis Hubbard, who is the CEO of um, the company is called the Short Street Strategic Solutions, LLC. I want to thank Mazda Denon, who is the trade manager for the Trade and International Affairs uh, Office of the City of Houston at the uh, Mayor's Office. I also want to thank uh, my esteemed friend, Adun Dennis, who's the CEO of, of Marial Africa, for his contribution. You guys have been an amazing, amazing uh, crew. I look forward to networking with all of you offline and working. Um, I want to leave us with this thought here. There, we are in a very unique time in two different unique periods. These unique periods are this, uh, are this. One is that we are in a COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, it is what it is. There's not much we can do about that besides make sure that our personal health and hygiene is um, number one. We have the unique opportunity as diasporans and as Africans to reconnect. And I think we, were, we are seeing more and more of that happening. And by having programs and platforms such as this, that is becoming more and more a reality. So please let us not lose out our, our um, the, the opportunity. Let's not lose hope even during this particular pandemic. Let's, let's fight through it. Let's push through it. Continue the dialogues. And I think we'll uh, come out better, especially in the improvement, the economic improvement of all African peoples and African diasporans everywhere. So I want to thank you guys once again for your uh, valuable contributions and your input and your insight. Thank you so much. And uh, Guba, you. you've done it again. Thank you.